morning, everyone. I am Vinod Vasudevan. I am a faculty of civil engineering here at UAA. Welcome to UAA Professional Development Seminar. Our presenter today is Ms. Erika Jensen, PE, PTOE, who is a principal project engineer at CRW. Her bio is listed in the flyer. Uh, Ms. Jensen moved to Alaska from Missouri side of Kansas City in 2003. She earned her BS in civil engineering and MS in engineering management from UAA. She works in designing roads, trails, school sites, and airport taxiways. She loves all outdoor activities, including traveling. The title of today's presentation is Northern Lights Boulevard, Chester Street, Crossing Emergency Repair. So please welcome Ms. Jensen. All right, let me go ahead and share my PowerPoint. All right, that looked good still? Yes. Awesome, thank you. So thank you again, I am Erica Jensen and I am with CRW Engineering Group and today I'll be presenting on the Northern Lights Boulevard Chester Creek Crossing Emergency Repair Project. Maybe. My computer froze. We just tested this. There we go. Okay, sorry. This is the outline of what I'll be talking about. Introduction, project needs, design fundamentals, design challenges, permitting and utilities, successes, and then at the very end, to keep you all entertained, I have a cool video. We'll dive right in with introductions. So the project team consisted of a very large because it was so fast paced and diverse project, including the municipality of Anchorage, MOA, project management and engineering. And also from the municipality of Anchorage, they did public involvement as well as we had the construction inspectors involved in the design. So that was actually part of the design project team. Solstice did the permitting, that is with North Architects and Planners, BNAP did the landscape architecture. Under separate contracts, Shannon and Wilson did the geotechnical investigation and recommendations and Steffel did the storm drain inspection. CRW, that's us, we did the survey. It was also under a separate contract. I'll get into that later, as well as the design. Here's the project timeline. And there's a lot of items in here because there were a lot of items, but what you might not notice is how it begins in December of 2019 and it ends in, let me get my cool pen out. And it ends in September of 2020. So less than nine months from like start to complete completion. In December of 2019, a sinkhole developed in Northern Lights Boulevard and was discovered. In December of 2019 as well, two days before Christmas, the RFP was advertised. It was a short request for proposal. And concurrently with that, under separate contracts, the survey, the geotech, and the storm drain inspection were happening at the same time in December and January. CRW bid on the project, and we were the successful design consulting firm selected, and our NTP was issued February 5th. Less than a month later, on March 4th, we submitted the preliminary engineering and culvert technical memo. This is a shortened version of the design study report that I'll talk about in a little bit. Culvert bid documents had to be submitted ahead of the design because of the long lead time for the concrete and the rebar in the culvert. So those were submitted March 13th. COVID lockdown happened March 17th. I know this isn't the like official date, but it's the official date for me because that was the date school shut down and um, what do you do with your kid now? But Project goes on, so March 18th, a day later, we submitted the 65% construction documents. The oil and grit separator, the OGS, also had to be submitted early because of, again, long lead time for that item. Those are submitted on April 10th. April 15th, five days later, but again, the OGS bid document was submitted before the design document. We submitted 95% construction documents. The project was bid for construction April 29th. Construction was awarded June 11th. Construction occurred for the roadway shutdown portion, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They had a very short roadway construction allowance. So that's what ended up with the seven days a week, 24 hours a day construction. This right here is longer time, obviously June to September is longer than 30 days, but there was some ancillary work going off on the side of the road after the road was reopened. What was happening concurrently during all of this was utility coordination and relocation, permitting as well as public involvement. So we'll start with project need. Why did we do this project? Sorry, this next slide is a big picture, so there we go. 
Northern Lights Boulevard, you all know the area. It is a major arterial, classified as a major arterial, and it is a major commuter route between east-west Anchorage as well as access from the valley. It provides access to university as well as the hospital, so the UMED area as we know it. Although, even though it's a major arterial and a major commuter route, uh, this was during COVID. So, uh, I guess a positive side effect of COVID was the, the traffic volumes were down. The two culverts are located right here, as you can see in red. And we have wetlands on the south side as well as the north side, as well as two parcels, two properties, parcel one and parcel two. And here's Chester Creek Drive. Here is the culvert. So this was Steffel conducting the storm drain inspection. Uh, you can notice the date, December 22nd. And if you remember, the RFP was advertised December 23rd. So not only was this project fast paced from the design standpoint, it was fast paced from everything. So MOA, pm &E was working December 22nd, getting this report from Steffel, submitting out the RFP on the 23rd. So everybody involved in this was so dedicated to making this work in the timeframe that we had allowed. You can see that clearly there's issues with this culvert. The, there is metal loss um, in the top of the culvert. So this obviously is going to create a sinkhole above it. You can see there's also metal loss in the sides of the culvert. So all of the, the adjacent backfill is going to enter into the culvert, which is going to create more sinkholes as well, as well as just structural integrity loss. And you can see that the culvert is squishy. Um, the, it is no longer round. It has a 38% ovality. So that is why we needed to replace the culvert. Design fundamentals, the next one. So the main part of the project, replace the culvert and improve this passage. That was the, the big impetus for the project. Obviously the roadway was filling above it, but that was the reason why we were doing it. Replace these culverts that were installed in the 1980s. The ancillary one, so that came into effect of that, is gonna reconstruct the roadway above it and improve the lighting. So anything we hit or impacted, we went ahead and tried to upgrade and improve. The roadway has a 4% super elevation at the creek crossing. Um, like I said, it is a classified as a class three major arterial with an average daily traffic of 54,500 vehicles a day. Um, that's during non-COVID times, but that's what it was classified as. We also knew that the parks department had plans to, to construct a pathway um, along the north side of the roadway. So when we were looking at culvert length as well as improvements above the culvert, we wanted to make sure we provided for that future pathway along the north side. There's also a water line that runs underneath the culvert currently and did. And we knew AU had plans to upsize that water lane. So let's go ahead and do that because why would we want them to go back in and replace this new culvert we put in? Could we improve the storm drain system while we were in there? Again, it was installed in the 80s with the culvert. So it's corrugated metal pipe that's currently in there and was undersized um, as well as can we improve the material from corrugated metal pipe to corrugated polyethylene pipe. We're also impacting some signal systems, some loop detectors. So while we're in there, could we do any upgrades to the signal system as well as the inner ties between the signals at UAA Drive and Lake Otis? During all this, we wanted to make sure we minimized impact to utilities as well as to aquatic life and habitat. Here's a little overview, a figure of the project to give you an idea of some of the things we are facing. Let me change my pen option so that it's a different color than the red here. Um, let's go green. So the two green culverts are the existing five foot diameter culverts that were installed in the 1980s. Here is the water line that runs underneath the culvert. So we're gonna replace that and upsize it. We have two storm drain manholes. Here's one as well as here's the other. And these are not the regular manholes. These are the old style oil trap manholes. So when we impacted this one down here, we went ahead and upgraded it to an oil grid separator. That's the new style that is preferred as, um, both for efficiency of actually separating material as well as preferred by maintenance. This one up here, we considered upgrading. However, since it was outside of our project limits, this red dash line is the excavation limits. We decided not to upgrade it, one, because of lead time for the items, as well as we, again, had 30 days to construct and close the road. I'm um, sorry, close the road and construct the improvements that required road closure. So we didn't want to add anything extra that didn't have to be done. You can see there's a lot of utility lines. Here's an overhead electric line here. These are actually high voltage transmission lines. Some of the lines over here are regular distribution lines, and there's a difference between what you can and can't do in relation to the high voltage transmission lines versus the lower voltage distribution lines. 
another big item that became a factor in how we did the design and made our choices is there's a utility pole right here. Yes, that is like right at the wing wall, as you can see. There's other underground utilities that are pretty standard in terms of relocation items and the stream diversion. We looked at, could we actually construct the culvert, like the new culvert, could we put it over here and then relocate the creek? And then we wouldn't have to worry about diverting the stream. We could just construct the new culvert and then move the stream. But the impacts of that are, well, you move the stream. So you also then move the floodplain, and then you have to remap the floodplain, which was outside of the scope of what this project entailed. But we did look at it because we thought it would help reduce construction time by being able to concurrently construct the thing without having to divert the stream. So that's an idea of our blown up project area site. Here is a section view of the project area site. The existing culverts are not shown in this for clarity, but you can see the new culvert right here, new culvert, and the water line. You can see how the water line runs, well, would run under the new culvert. One thing that was kind of fun during this project is we're sitting around the table working on this and we're looking at this figure discussing it for some other reason. And somebody extends this water line and is like, oh, oh, that's kind of close to the diversion creek. Uh-oh, are we gonna be able to, or do we actually have to continue the water line? Um, sorry, I'm trying to make it clear for you guys. Do we have to continue the water line that's not blue. Continue the water line relocation under the diversion and then go up. Do we have to do that? Because this is pretty close right here. So that was a fun thing that I thought is, that really comes into play in, in terms of collaboration and sitting around the table talking about these things. We discovered that we didn't know the answer and I'll get into that later as we just talk about the water line relocation. But here you can see we have the creek diversion, which did provide for some freeboard in terms of this, the restoring vents. We have the water line relocation underneath it. We have excavation limits for the creek, like I talked about. And then we also have the overhead um, electric lines that were also an impact. The excavation limits were a factor because we were concerned with how, where were they were going to be able to stage. Um, it looks like we were not going to be able to place culverts in the diversion channel. So the staging would all have to occur on this side of the roadway. So we wanted to try to reduce the excavation limits, which is why there's two here. But I'll talk about that a little more when we get into that detail. So the tech memo, we started with the tech memo. And as you know, most projects start with a design study report. And this looks at controlling factors, aspects you have to consider, involves public involvement, data research, analysis, alternatives analysis, and it's, it's normally a couple months project or a couple months effort to do a design study. We didn't have a couple months, so we did an abbreviated version. We looked at all the things that were necessary, but we did the abbreviated version and we did a tech memo. It did and still do everything we needed, the design study analysis. The existing capacity of the two five foot diameter culverts is 162 cubic feet per second. The required capacity is 471 cubic feet per second. So obviously we needed to do something and replace these culverts, not just because they were failing from metal loss, they were not adequate. We also analyzed various culvert types, um, aluminum with overflow pipes, steel with overflow pipes to accommodate the flood. I'll talk about that more in the next slide, or a concrete culvert. We also analyzed different water line relocation methods, open trench versus trenchless. And like I said, we looked at storm drain upgrades. Can we upgrade the storm drain while we're in there? And the answer for that one was yes, that was a pretty easy decision. Um, but like I said, we decided to only impact, only upgrade what we impacted. When we were looking at the culvert type, there was a lot of asterisks that went into the design of the culvert and the analysis. It wasn't just a straight, which one is better. There was quite a few factors that impacted the analysis and in the matrix table that I'll talk about. One of them was the cover. Um, over the water, I'm sorry, over the culvert, as well as the cover over the water line below. You can see that there's a, here's the um, super elevation that I mentioned earlier of the roadway over the culvert. So on the high side of the roadway, the south side, we have a maximum cover of five feet. On the low side, the north side, we have a maximum cover, a minimum cover of one foot. If you actually look in the center, the cover is less than one foot, but we considered maybe we can put a swale and increase that cover. But then if you look at what an aluminum culvert can handle, 
the minimum cover is 1.4 feet. And that assumes it has a full invert. A full invert just means that the bottom of the culvert is not open to the ground. It's actually metal as well. So we can't do aluminum because we have less than 1.4 feet. Steel uh, also needs less than, or needs more than 1.5 feet. So we can't do steel. Max is nine feet, so we're covered there. But we can't do it because of the minimum. So steel's out. Concrete can handle a one foot minimum cover. So, okay. We can, we can look more concrete. And the water line below was just something we considered in terms of um, access and maintenance for constructing. How deep did they have to go to construct it just for construction time? The other issue with the aluminum and the steel is that both of them would need a parallel bypass pipe to handle the flood events. Requiring that is, is not uncommon. You can definitely do that. You'll see it all around the state. You'll have a culvert with a bypass flood pipe, but it would slow down construction. And like I've mentioned multiple times, and I will continue to mention because it was such a big factor in all the decisions going into the design, is can you construct it in those 30 days? So constructing a parallel bypass pipe would just slow down construction, even though the steel and the aluminum are lighter weight than the concrete. Um, steel also is not as resistant to corrosion. Yes, it can be treated, but the treating can, of course, be dented and scratched during construction as well as just from scour. Concrete works in terms of the flow capacity and the cover, um, but it's heavier and that slows down construction. So that was a negative to the concrete culvert. So we looked at a matrix because we all love matrices and tables and spreadsheets. And we rated each item of the aluminum, the steel, and the concrete from worst. We gave them a zero if it was worst. We gave them a one if it was okay. And then we gave them a two if it was the best. And then based on this, the highest score would win because they would have all the highest best items. We looked at a lot of these, again, were driven by time and schedule because of the short duration for not only the project, but the delivery of the item as well as the construction. So we looked at fabrication schedule, shipping and delivery schedule, installation time required, size of equipment for installation because we had those overhead lines as well as the staging location issues. The flow capacity, because well, we are designing a culvert. The contractor familiarity, which came into play due to the short construction window. If the contractor is not familiar and runs into errors, then we're not gonna be able to meet that 30 day road closure limit. The durability longevity of the culvert. Again, we are designing a project. We're not just opening a roadway. Head wall and wing wall aesthetics, access for maintenance, vulnerability to damage during construction, construction risks and unknowns. Again, these are all just coming into play in that 30 day window and costs, always look at costs. So after all this was said and done, the concrete culvert came out as the winner. So yay, tech memo has been completed, concrete culvert selected. Before we completed the tech memo though, like I said, we talked about the water line. What are we gonna do, open trench or trench list? These, since there weren't as many, we just rated them bad, negative, nah, zero, or good, positive. For open trench, you dig everything up and literally open it up. Um, it's conventional, and that was a positive because the contractors know it, and it's the known method. There's lot, there's less unknowns and risks. Uh, schedule is obviously a negative because it takes longer. You have to open everything up, and costs are a positive because they are. It is less expensive than trenchless. Trenchless is positive is that it is doesn't take as long. You can do it trenchless. You don't have to close the road to do it. The negatives though were limited contractor availability. There are not tons of contractors who can do this work. So would they even be available or have they already been booked for jobs that summer? Um, and cost is more expensive. We ended up choosing open trench because the schedule could be adjusted and we could hopefully fit that in. So talked about all the factors that went into the design the choices to pick what we're gonna do. Now we have to actually do the design of a concrete culvert with an open trench water line. Some of the design challenges, obviously we know the schedule. I've talked about it a lot and it is there. We had 76 days from the NTP notice to proceed to the construction bid documents. That's less than three months. And normally you have two years. Um, from beginning to end of the project, it was 147 days. So you throw COVID into all this and the schedule was was definitely a challenge. There were only seven days in the week and I was working all of them with the whole team. The whole team was working seven days a week. So uh, luckily there's a short amount of time we were doing that, but schedule was a big challenge. Next was the separate contract. This was issued because of the schedule and these items normally happen at the beginning of the contract, but because we had such a short time, they had to happen before the contract. So using separate contracts that were already in place, 
CRW did the surveying, Shannon and Wilson did the geotechnical inspection, I'm sorry, investigations as well as recommendations, and Steffel did the culvert inspection. <laughs> these, <coughs> pardon me, these are pictures of the surveyors doing the survey in December and January, and they had to set up a bridge across the creek in order to get the invert and elevations of the creek, as well as dig through the frozen creek top to get what the bottom of it was. So these, are, well, it made me glad I was not a surveyor during this day. Another consideration was, can they do it in 30 days? Like we could have picked a steel culvert. We could have picked an aluminum culvert. We could have picked trenchless water. All of those we would have been able to do a successful engineering design. But the factor was not just the engineering design. It was the whole project, which included constructing a 30-day max road closure. This is where it was really helpful that the construction inspector from pm &E, Matt Newton, he came to the design meetings weekly. We had weekly design meetings for this fast pace project, and it was really helpful to have a construction inspector's input in the design as we were designing it. So we wanted to reach out to the crane companies. We, of course, did not want to then preclude them from bidding on the project. So we reached out to all the crane companies just to see what their thoughts were. Could they do this? Can they put a heavy concrete culvert into where it needs to be with this overhead line above? So then what we looked at is if here is our, we have our excavation limits here. Like I said earlier, we tried to reduce them. So later on, we had the roadway excavation limits were higher, but we wanted the crane as close as we could be. Then we had, you know, here's where our culvert is going to be. So here's going to be our little culvert. I guess it's not little, it's a pretty big culvert. We got our culvert right here. Ooh, wow, my drawing skills are awesome. So we looked at the max weight and reach of the crane. So if here's our staging yard over here, and here's our culvert section, can this crane come over here, pick up this culvert, and come back and place it where it needs to be. Oh no, it's hit the overhead line, boom, bad. That's not gonna be good. So we looked at that. We actually looked at these diagrams of the max weight and reach of the crane and could it lift up this culvert section. So in the culvert bid documents, we actually had to put in a maximum weight per section. And then in the construction bid documents, we put in what that weight was so that they knew and they could do these same exercises of how do you do this without hitting these overhead lines. So culvert construction. We had these uh, bid earlier, like I mentioned, and we looked at different foundation types as well as the culvert sections themselves. For the foundations, we ended up using what was just known as express foundation in this uh, company's thing. And this helped reduce the time in the field of that 30-day road closure, it, could, it made more work ahead of time. So as you can see, all the rebar is placed already in these sections. And then they come in and then they just fill in the sections with concrete in the field. Here's the, the, where the culvert will sit over here. You can see that. So here are the express foundations down here that have been filled with concrete. So again, we tried to maximize what could be done ahead of time to minimize what needed to be done within that 30 days. We also looked at headspace in the culvert. You can see here, there's very little clearance for this bobcat. Um, clearance for a person, but the bobcat was the issue when they're placing all this stream substrate, which is heavy. We wanted to make sure they could do it with a bobcat, not by hand. Yes, you can do it by hand, but it's gonna take a lot longer. And that's one thing we don't have with this project is time. So we had three bid documents with this project. And designing is one thing, but preparing bid documents is a different level. You have to make the document ready to be bid. And so that was a factor in terms of the effort that we and the city put in um, and everybody involved in had to do because we had end purchasing and pm &E because we had three separate bid documents. In addition to having three bid documents, both the culvert and the oil and grit separator were bid and procured prior to finalizing the design. So, you know, cross your fingers, hope you didn't mess up because that's what we're getting. We didn't, it was good, but still crossed our fingers. Some of the design challenges continued. I have talked about the excavation limits. We were allowed to have a one and a half to one for the culvert construction, um, but we needed a one to two for the roadway. So this four feet is about, is what the roadway subgrade would need to be in terms of supporting the pavement and everything above the roadway. 
to construct the culvert, though, we were able, the geotechnical recommendations allowed a one and a half stone, which is a little steeper, which seems, this picture does have a vertical exaggeration, but it doesn't seem like that much. But again, if our crane is over here versus right here, we wanted our crane as close as we could get it to not hit those overhead lines up there again. We had some really fun right of way findings with this project when we were doing our design as well as when the surveys were doing their survey. Back in the 1980s, when the DOT project constructed this roadway and, and the storm drain and the culvert, um, they, this is a section line easement highlighted in yellow. The project included a 30 foot uh, right of way easement to put the roadway fully within the right of way, as you would expect, the roadways within the public right of way. This was including the project to put this in there. Somehow, though, this 30 foot easement never got dedicated. It, it just didn't happen. It, it, I don't know, fell down the list on the email at the second page and nobody found it and it never got dedicated. So when we went into this project, we discovered that this yellow highlighted line is actually where the right of way is. We do not technically have access to even be right there. On a good note, this, prop, this parcel up here belongs to Parks, which is a municipal agency. So we were able to do, MOA was able to do some internal agreements for access for construction to allow legal access into this parcel up here. And then afterwards, once those temporary ones were allocated and granted for legal access, then they could make it official. The overhead transmission lines Yes, I've mentioned these. These were a big factor as well. These were the high voltage overhead transmission lines. These over here were the lower voltage distribution lines. You can see there's a line right down here. Let me change this to red so you guys can see it better with this blue. Yeah, there we go. Here is a fiber optic line. Eh, no big deal, right? I mean, it is a big deal, but luckily this one we we're able to get raised. So that was helpful. These distribution lines as well as the transmission lines. We looked at relocating them. We looked at relocating this pole that was right here. We looked at all the different options and they could not be relocated. So what we were able to do was get both of these lines de-energized for a short amount of time, a couple of days is I think what we got, one to three days. And what that does is normally around these high voltage lines, you have this big radius of area you can't enter. So no crane can go into this big radius. When the lines are de-energized, the radius is smaller, so you can get closer to the line. So that helped quite a bit, so then our crane could enter that space. Same thing over here. You had a smaller radius that you weren't allowed to enter when the lines were de-energized. Water lines, I mentioned the water line earlier, and another fun finding, love finding, fun facts about projects if you don't know you're going to hit. We didn't know where the water line was. Um, the project, you can see the date here in 1981. I doubt half of you are even alive. I was. Showed that the water line, this dark blue one, it showed that it wasn't constructed here. These were these little X's that the water line wasn't constructed here, but that it was actually constructed in this, the lighter blue, the cyan line. But you looked at the AWU record drawings down here and the red line down here, we drew in. That's not what they had. They showed this blue line, which is this blue line. So where's the water line? Is it up here with the cyan or is it down here with the darker blue? And this new valve, is it there? Is it not there? We couldn't find it. And AWU couldn't find it. And it, we didn't know if it had been paved over so much with all the repaving of the project or the roadway since the 1980s. But we couldn't find this valve. Nobody could find this valve. And the location of the water line was one thing. We can probably work around that. It you know, shouldn't be too big of a deal. It's still under the culvert either way, whatever location, it's still under the culvert. But the valve was a big deal because if, we, if this valve did not exist, it meant we couldn't turn off the water line at this valve. And if we can't turn it off at this valve, it meant all these parcels over here would need temporary water. Temporary water just adds a different aspect, another aspect to the project. Again, it's not uncommon. It's not something you can't do, but it's not something this project had time to do. And so we really needed to make sure that this valve existed. We tried to pothole the water line to see where it was, and we couldn't find it. So we gave up on trying to determine where the water line was ahead of the construction, but we needed the water valve. 
So with the water valve, ABU ended up installing an inline valve ahead of the project so that we knew there was a valve we could turn off and isolate the water shut down and not require temporary water. So the water line, since we didn't know where it was, we weren't totally positive about its elevation. And, and again, I showed earlier how it might be actually running through or very close to the stream diversion. We put in the provisions that the contractor had to reload or had to locate the water line before he started anything else and tell us where it was. And then he might have to extend the relocation of the water line. We were able to cover it. It all worked out. We didn't have to extend it, but we did have to cover ourselves there for in case the water line wasn't where we thought it was. We also had very strict construction windows. The clearing, the bird clearing window has to, our clearing, so like if you're going to clear trees down here, for example, it has to occur before the birds build their nests. Well, that's not going to work with this project. So under a separate contract, MOA was able to get the clearing done ahead of the bird nest. And you can see here in this picture on the bottom left, this was like April um, before the birds have returned and made their nests. And we staked, our surveyor staked the clearing limits. So here you can see all this in here will be cleared. So we're able to accommodate that by doing it ahead of time under a separate contract. And then of course there was um, the fish passage when the fish run. And I will get into more of that with the permitting and utilities because leads perfectly into permitting and utilities. Permitting utilities. Here's the list of all the permits we had to obtain. I won't go into detail on all of them, but some I'll point out. The flood hazard permit, we did not want to remap the floodplain. So that one was not included. That would have been a whole different effort, but we did have to get a flood hazard permit. Alaska Department and Fish Again, they had a couple of concerns. One was there was a concurrent reconstruction of the culvert at Arctic, same, same creek. So that was just something they were kind of concerned about is that there would be two obstacles to fish migration with these concurrent constructions. We had to look at the out migration of rainbows, which run through mid-June, and then adult coho salmon migration begins in mid-August. So we were allowed um, mid-June through mid-August to for our diversion. So that luckily gave us a little bit of leeway to set our 30-day closure because we had about 60 days for um, the diversion allowance, which would either way fall within the 30-day road closure. Like I said, we didn't change the flood hazard permit. Um, the tree clearing window we got ahead of time for permitting for that. And then the noise permit, pm &E obtained this ahead of time for the contractor, knowing that most likely the contractor would have to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and need a noise permit. So just to speed up that process, PM &E went and got that ahead of him, ahead of time for him. One thing you might notice in this picture is um, the stream diversion is over here. This is looking south. Sorry, <laughs> this is looking south. Um, here's the new culvert over here, and here's the stream diversion. Y you'll notice that there are culverts in the stream diversion. This was something, that, like I mentioned, we didn't think we were going to be able to do. That was our impression from uh, Fish and Game. The contractor was able to get that to happen, which is great. It made life so much easier because then he had access from both sides, this side as well as that side. So that was something that definitely helped in keeping the schedule going for him and for everybody because we're all invested in this. Utilities. I've talked quite a bit about the utilities. The overhead lines, we were not able to relocate. We looked at that. The pole, Again, if you're wondering, the pole is right here. So it's super close to the existing culverts and basically on top of our new culvert. The underground shallow utilities, this does not include water, sewer, or storm drain, but the uh, commonly, commonly called shallow utilities of uh, cable, fiber optic, telephone, electric, those were not challenging in and of themselves. They were pretty standard relocations. The challenge came into making sure they happened within the time frame of the project. So for example, if a normal project, the contractor says, hey, we're going to be doing this. ACS, can you come out and do this? There's some, there's some play in that schedule. Maybe not a lot, but there's some play. And for our project, we had zero play. We're like, nope, you need to be out within 30 minutes of when he calls or whatever it was. I, I didn't make that coordination. But there was, there was such a short time frame that we had to have ACS, MLMP, CEA. This was before they were joined. So we had both of them we were dealing with and GCI really on top of things planned and ready to go and set. Here's a plan view and then a section view of all the utilities. A lot of the shallow utilities are right up here, uh, like the telephone, the electric. We 
did improve, make some signal improvements because we were in that area. Other shallow utilities over here would end up below the creek bed. And that was, again, where the, the quick time frame came into play in terms of getting these installed while the roadway was um, closed. You can see all the overhead. There's the overhead fiber optic one. We were able to luckily raise that one. Overhead electric here, overhead electric here. So there's just a lot of utility constraints. And again, our most favorite utility pole right there. There was a lot of challenges, as you can see, um, in all those slides I've just shown, and a lot of constraints to making sure that not only did the design meet the, the engineering requirements of, of culvert conveyance of the creek, roadway above it, and fish passage, but could it be done in the 30-day window that we were allowed to have? There were a lot of successes. The first and foremost being the, the team that was involved in it, pm &E, construction inspectors, um, public involvement, the CRW design team, all the external contracts that are happening concurrently from the clearing ahead of time to Stuckel being out there three days before Christmas and walking through a frozen creek um, in a squished culvert. Communication was huge. We met weekly and then we're talking. I think I talked to Brooke every single day, Brooke Blessing from PMD every single day of this, um, have her cell phone number. And, uh, just always had to stay on top of things. Adaptability, what do we do when we can't move that utility pole that we thought we we're going to be able to move or, you know, raise those lines or that water line? We don't know where it is. How are we going to accommodate that? From the project management side, we had, I had massive numbers of spreadsheets, notes, agendas, and task lists and kept everybody up to date daily and they stayed on top of it. But one of the other aspects that really helped is we can do everything we can behind the scenes to make sure the design goes well, but we don't have as much control over the construction. But again, that's where it helped having uh, Matt Newton involved ahead of time in the, con in the design to help with any construction concerns when we're doing the design. We met weekly on site with the contractor and we met at, I believe it was 7 p.m. So we would hit both the, the day shift as well as the night shift and we could we could talk to both foremen as well as the um, general manager. But the another aspect is pm and &E, and we decided that it would be worthwhile for this project to put in an early finish bonus for the contractor. He had 30-day road closure, and for reference, a recent culvert construction project was allowed a 45-day road closure, and it went over a couple of days. So not only did they not meet their 45 days, which was more than we have, they went over it. So what are we gonna to do to make sure that this project meets their 30 days? We included in the special provisions an early finish bonus. If you finish the road closure portion ahead of the 30 days, you will get a certain monetary value for each day you finish ahead of time. And the contractor made it work. He finished ahead of time and was able to get that bonus. Additionally, behind the scenes to make things, the purchasing and bid process go ahead go smoothly is MOA purchasing put the 65% plans on their website ahead of the bid so that they could do a shortened bid period and not frighten off the contractors. So the contractors knew it was coming at the 65% design. So there's a lot of moving parts and pieces to make sure the end goal was met in terms of design and construction and schedule. So now that you've had nothing but listening to me talk and draw on the slides, I am going to show you guys some photos, and then we have a cool time-lapse video. What we did is we installed uh, their, their game cameras, actually, that you use for hunting, and we installed them on trees outside of the clearing limits, of course, and they would take a photo every 20 minutes or whatever we set the timer to, and this was useful not only for this cool video you'll see, but also so that we could check on construction at any point and be like, oh, have they finished the culvert installation? Oh, look, they're diverting the channel. So it helped from our standpoint, as well as, you know, anybody we gave this link to, pm &E could access this and check on the construction. We'll start with just a little before and after. Here's the culvert that was removed uh, before. And here's the culvert after. Obviously, these are not totally before, totally after, but I liked what they showed. I liked this one, how it really showed the low flow stream channel as well as the, um, the freeboard area for any flood events. As well, it's just a pretty smooth concrete. The contractors must have excavated this pink bowling pin because it rotated around the site every week when I went out there. So it just ended up in this photo. But we'll now do some time lapse 
you can see this pole right here. This is the pole that never moved, and which was good because once we didn't want it to move, it shouldn't move. June 3rd, this is a pure before picture, but you can see the clearing has occurred. This happened before the bird nesting window. So the clearing has occurred, but this is the two five foot diameter culverts on June 3rd. By July 8th, once they had fully started, they have closed the road. So road is closed now, as you can tell. Culverts are still there, down here, still culverts. But they're starting on excavating the diversion channel. So that's July 8th. So July 13th, five days later, the culvert has been, con I'm sorry, the di creek has been diverted. And luckily, like I said, they're able to get access from this side, which just made it really nice. And they are working on the foundation for the culvert. For the shoring pan plan for the pole, we had the contractor, the contractor was required to create the shoring plan and then it was going to be approved by um, MLPCEA um, because when it was, it was the utility company's pole, we wanted to make sure they were okay with the shoring plan and because the contractor was going to be implementing the shoring, we wanted the contractor to be required to do the shoring plan. This was, this was their shoring plan. It was approved and it worked. The, the pole did not move. So four days later, they are installing the, or they've installed the uh, foundation and filled them with concrete. And now they're installing the sections right here. Cool way they did this is, you can see the crane is way over here on this side of the roadway. This is the north side of the roadway. Um, the pole obviously is on the south side. What they did is they lifted the sections down on the north side of the roadway. And you can kind of see these, there's like little rollers in here. You can kind of see those. And they would push the sections into place towards the south so that the crane had more clearance behind our uh, side of these overhead lines that were there. So they actually pushed all these sections into place. So this is July 17th. This down here is also July 17th, down on the bottom left. All these sections are in place now, as well as the wing walls and the head walls. And yay, the pole is still standing. Always good to know. Two days later, July 19th, they've completed all the culvert sections are in and they're starting to now backfill um, around the culvert. It was important that they backfilled concurrently along, along both sides in order to not collapse the culvert um, and just for stability. So that's also where it came into really handy that they had access from over here so that they could, it was just a lot easier for them to backfill both sides. You see a little bobcat below, putting in the stream substrate and able to do that not by hand. So that's July 19th, July 22nd, three days later, they've completed all of the roadway backfill, the stream substrate, you can see that is all in the culvert and they're gonna, they've compacted it or are compacting it to construct the roadway. Two days after that, they are undiverting the stream. And then two days after that, they are finishing the grading for the roadway. Don't forget OSHA safety requirements, always need to have that. And then, I jumped because I wanted it to look a little prettier. September 3rd, we have the grass is starting to grow. We have the safety fence, the pole is still standing, the creek is flowing through the culvert where we want it to, and the landscape has been placed. So with that, I will show you a cool video. This is a time-lapse video of the... Um, I'm going to minimize that to make sure that you can see. So we are not seeing anything. Just, I think it may be in a different stream. We are not seeing anything. Oh, because I shared application. Thank you, Vinod. Okay, let me share screen. Um, you're right, I shared application. Are you seeing it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.
That concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Yes, I think I will get started. So thank you very much for the presentation. It was you know, very exciting and the details are you know, amazing what uh, goes into these kind of projects. So my question is, uh, so what is a typical uh, design life of Gullbirds? I have a couple of questions. That's the first one. And then second question is, do we have any scheduled replacement strategy so that this kind of, we don't have to do it in emergency? So the typical design life of a culvert uh, will vary depending on obviously what is requested for the project, but it can be anywhere from 20 to 40 years for what you're looking at in terms of uh, when you're picking design life, somewhere between 20, maybe even up to 50, but I, I think 50 is pretty str strong. 50 tends to be more for bridges. Uh, 20 to 40 would be, 40 would be the high side of the design life. 20 to 30 be more accurate. And then strategies to prevent this from happening in the future. This is the instigated an inspection of culverts to, to make sure that all the culverts that were constructed in this time frame don't rapidly fail during like these, this one and another one nearby did as well. So yes, there are active measures to inspect and analyze culverts along the creeks. Thank you. Andrew, do we have any questions from audience? Um, well, some comments. Uh, the time lapse was pretty astounding to watch. Is is one of the comments that we've got. No questions yet. Okay, I'll take that comment. So well, I can put. I think my email's on the last page. Um, so I'll put that. So if there are any questions, please feel free to email me or call me and I'd be happy to answer any that come up. So the inspections, I mean, you said about inspections since I'm not receiving any questions, so I just asked one more question. So you said there's an active kind of uh, inspection going on. So who is uh, conducting it? Is it like DOG or municipality? Who is doing that inspection for this culvert failure or potential failure? Did it Oh, sorry. The culverts that are owned by pm &E will be inspected by pm &E as part of a project. Um, that one I'm not actively involved in, but the culvert will be inspected by the owner of the culvert. So the culverts that are owned by pm &E or MOA would be inspected by the MOA. Okay, so, we, uh, yeah, we so, do yeah. have a question that came through on, on the chat, sorry. Uh, which is how did COVID impact the project? Were team members still able to meet in person? And what, what were some of the other impacts? So yeah, that one was really challenging because we were meeting weekly in person. And like I said, it really showed me when we sat around the table and just drew a line along that water line, it helped it, it spur ideas of like, oh, we need to consider this. We were not able to meet in person. The meetings stopped abruptly and but we couldn't we couldn't stop them we this project had to go forward and we couldn't even delay it so we moved to zoom and teams and phone calls and text messages and emails so we were not able to meet in person the one thing that was nice is when we were doing the once construction began in the summer we were able to meet in person on site so that was really helpful is that we were able to then meet in person because we were outside on site. So we were able to meet to inspect the culvert in the lay down yard at the culvert manufacturer because it was outside. So that was helpful that those inspections were outside, but in terms of design, no, we, we stopped and could not meet in person, but the meetings didn't stop. We just had to stop meeting in person. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I don't have any other questions here in the chat. Okay, I think if you don't have any other questions, then we will. I know I can thank uh, Jerica, uh, sorry, Erica for a wonderful presentation. And those who are, at, uh, you know, who are looking for PDH credit, the password for today's talk is emergency. Again, the password is emergency. In all, all lowercase. All lowercase. Thank you, Andrew.
thank you eric again and you know we'll uh, we'll see okay again one more announcement this is the last presentation for the semester for in this series so please uh, uh, check the website for our future presentation uh, coming up in spring semester